are so glad to be worshiping together with you this morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, will you please stand as I read from God's word? Nehemiah 9, verses 1 through 6. On the 24th day of the month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God and said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, O God, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles.
Would you please join me in a unison prayer of confession, praying together the words on the screens. O oh God and Father of all, your word calls us to be mindful of all that we do in this life. The words we speak, the thoughts of our minds, and the, and the actions of our hearts. When we remember our lives before, we remember our sin. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as we should. We have sinned against you and against one another. Forgive us, Lord, for our many sins. Refresh our souls. Make us clean once again by the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to worship together this morning. We thank you that you have called so many faithful folks here this morning and brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus with whom we can share this time of fellowship and praise. It reminds us, Father, of what uh, was written in the Psalms that they were so excited when the brethren came unto them and said, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the place where we want to be. This is a place where we should be. This is a place where you have called us. And so, Father, thank you that we have a good God to come and worship. 
that we have a faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, to remind us that we're given grace and mercy. And Father, thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit, which has brought us here this morning. May this time of worship be one which brings glory and honor and praise to you and to you alone. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you all this morning. Um, If you are here for Sunday school, it looks like we got a a really good number again today. Uh, Make your way to the back. Uh, Miss Lisa and Mr. Keith are ready to teach you this morning. There goes half the church. (laughs) Praise the Lord. For the big kids who are here, let me take me uh, just a quick second to remind everybody, uh, next week, next Sunday, is March 12th, which means time change day, right? Was that on your list, Jen? (laughs) Okay, well, it's there now. (laughs) Time change, though, so don't forget to spring forward next week, right? Or uh, we're going to have church without you. You'll you'll miss it. So um, that happens next Sunday. Uh, Today, though, today at 2 p.m. is our special Lenten presentation from Chosen People Ministries. Uh, uh, The title of that uh, presentation is, Why Did He Have to Die? Why Did Messiah Have to Die? Taking a look at the crucifixion from the view of Judaism. We hope that you will make a plan to come back and join us today at 2 p.m. We will have dessert and coffee and great conversation uh, with the missionary from Chosen People. His name is Ryan Karp, um, and we're looking very forward to hearing a bit of the perspective of the of the Jewish people when it comes to the crucifixion. So please join us for that. Um, also, our Lenten dinner and discussion series finally went off without a hitch this week. Uh, we are so thankful that we were able to gather together uh, to have a great meal, a baked potato bar last week, and a great fellowship. Uh, we encourage you to join us again this week, Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Uh, dinner is a breakfast for dinner this week. We're having French toast, ham, uh, fruit, juice, coffee, um, and so please come and join us 6 p.m. this Wednesday. Study will begin approximately 6.45 uh, each week, and we are working our way through the book of the Judges, and this week we're going to uh, get pretty quickly to Deborah, uh, the great judge, and so um, we, we would look forward to having you come and join us for that each Wednesday evening uh, during Lent at 6 p.m. Also, uh, we have another eating opportunity for you because I think that's what we do best. Um, (laughs) It's amazing, like, you know, that we're a much larger congregation, if you know what I mean. But um, (laughs) our dinner and spiritual gifts assessment will be happening on uh, Saturday, March 11th, this coming Saturday at 5 p.m. So um, we need to be certain we know how many that we are preparing dinner for. This is going to be lasagna, fettuccine alfredo, uh, garlic bread salad, dessert, Um, And so please, if you have not yet signed up, please do that today. The sign-up sheet is at our information center, uh, just at the bottom of the steps there as you uh, go towards the bathrooms. Please make sure you sign up today. That happens this coming Saturday, March the 11th, beginning at 5 p.m. So please do let us know if you're coming. Um, also, all of these are food related uh, pretty much, but uh, we, we want to make sure that you have on your calendar Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday beginning at 8.30 a.m. will be our pancake breakfast, um, so we want to make sure that you'll be here for that. Remember, we will have our regular worship service at 10 a.m. following that, but please come at 8.30 for a time of fellowship, pancake, sausage served to you by some of your council members and other folks. Um, it will be uh, just a wonderful morning uh, of celebrating. And we know that Easter morning is a difficult morning to have a breakfast because, you know, everybody's got plans. So we thought we'd do Palm Sunday instead. That's April 2nd, beginning at 8.30 a.m. Do we have a sign-up sheet for that? No, we don't, right? No. Okay. Uh, and then just a quick um, 
update and reminder about our Easter schedule this year. Um, we will have our special dramatic Good Friday presentation that will happen on Friday evening, April 7th, beginning at 7 p.m. The theme this year is Break Every Chain. Um, and we are going to uh, come together and hear from Scripture and from the worship team about Jesus, who is the chain breaker. Um, and so we hope that you will join us for that, 7 p.m. on Good Friday, April 7th. And then 10 a.m. Easter morning, our Easter sunrise, or not sunrise, Easter Sunday celebration will take place at 10 a.m. Uh, as normal. So please join us for those two special opportunities uh, this coming Easter Sunday season. Um, I think I also should mention that uh, because we had to miss one of our Wednesday evening dinner discussions because of weather, uh, we're going to have that at the end of it. So the Wednesday of the week before Easter, when we would normally not have study that night, we are having that, that study that evening. That would be the 5th, April 5th, uh, and we will um, finish up the Judges series at that time. So Anything else that I'm missing? All right, great. In your bulletins this morning, you'll also find uh, a prayer list. A few weeks ago, we gave praise because there was nothing on the list. And it was a quiet time. Now we have the opposite. Um, we have a very, uh, a very lengthy list. But I want to just take a second to draw your attention to two folks um, who were scheduled to have surgery this week. And we give praise that both of them are with us in worship this morning and give thanks to God for leading them safely through. And so, yeah, let's just give a shout of praise. <laughs> Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father God, thank you for uh, your love for us. Thank you for the incredible ways that you work in our lives, more than we could ever think or imagine. Father, thank you for gathering us together in this place this morning, in the warmth of these people, the joy that we share together as the people of God the bond that binds us together in the love of Jesus Christ and the grace and mercy that he won for us. Father, we do give you thanks and praise that when we come before you and we kneel before you, you hear our prayers and you answer them. And so, Father, thank you for, for steadying the hands of surgeons this week and that folks who uh, have had surgery are able to be back together with us already. What a joy that is to have them here, and we, what a great testimony it is to your continuous love and care. And Father, thank you for the many other ways that you have heard our prayers this week. And so, Father, we, with confidence, the writer of Hebrews says, we kneel before you because we know that you hear us. And so we ask for those who are sick that you would bring healing for those who are grieving, that you would bring peace and comfort. Father, for those who have a great need, perhaps it's financial need or some other kind of need, Father, that you would provide all things. Jehovah Jireh, you are God, our provider. Father, we pray for relationships. We pray for our marriages, that you would help us to remain faithful to one another and to you. We pray for our friendships, that we would speak words of love, compassion, and that when necessary, Father, we would be so bold as to speak words of correction. And Father, we pray for ourselves, for our hearts, that they would be made right before you. That as King David said, you would cleanse us with a rod of hyssop, purge from our hearts the sinfulness of this world, that we might be made white as snow as we stand before you. Father, this morning, your word speaks to us of a great determination. Some people might call it a stubbornness even. But Father, when it comes to your word and your will for our lives, your love for us, may we be stubborn. <laughs> May we be so stubborn that we would never, ever let go of your love for us. 
that we would never, ever let go of your call to serve both you and the people we live with. Father, help us to be determined for you, for the gospel, and for your kingdom. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for this place, Cornerstone Faith Community Church, for all of these people who are gathered here. And we thank you for your love for us, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so it is in his name and for all of our sake that we ask each of these requests this morning. We give you this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, I would ask that wherever you are, you would stand for the reading of God's word this morning, that as we hear God's word, it would fall afresh on our hearts. We would rightly apply it to our lives and our hearts and our minds. This morning, we continue our look at Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 15. May God add the blessing of his blessing to the reading of his word for this morning. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I think... Uh, I think each and every one of us probably knows someone like the person that I am about to describe to you. This person is someone with whom we have a close relationship, a relationship close enough that we would regularly have moments of serious um, happenings of life kind of conversations with them. This person could very well live in your home this person could be a work companion, a, a close friend, a neighbor, perhaps an extended relative of one kind or another. Whoever this person is, they are someone that you have with some regularity had conversations about faith with. Yet even still, the topic of faith with this person Whenever it has been broached, there is some considerable amount of question in your mind. Does that person really accept Jesus as their savior, you wonder? Does that person believe in God, you may ask yourself. I have had numerous conversations with many of you about these kind of relationships in your lives. Uh, usually, those conversations go something like this. You know, Jeremy, I, I just don't know what to say about fill in the blank, whoever that person might be. I just don't know what to say about them. I mean, when we talk about God, they seem to suggest that they believe, but I just can't quite tell for sure. Or, or the conversation might be something like this. Uh, that person, he or she, says that they believe in God, but they won't come to church. They get angry when I ask them about coming to church. But they say they believe in God. You can probably relate to these kind of conversations with one or maybe more people in your life. These kinds of conversations always lead me to the same question. How is it that we can tell if someone actually believes in God? 
How can we tell if someone actually believes in God? Um, interestingly enough, a quick Google search asking, how can I tell if someone believes in God, returned some interesting results. The first one that I found interesting was this. It was a post to an open forum called Quora. It says, you cannot know what someone truly thinks or believes. You can only decide if you think their actions line up with what they claim to believe. You can't know what someone truly thinks or believes. You can only decide if their actions line up with the Reverend Billy Graham answers this question in a post on the Billy Graham website. He says, only God knows your friend's heart, of course, and whether or not he has truly given his life to Christ. However, if a person's life does not change in any way, the Bible warns that their faith is false, that they have not truly opened their hearts to Christ. Many people today, I'm afraid, say they believe in Christ and that they may show no interest, oh, I'm sorry, and that they may sincerely think they do, but their lives show no interest in it. They live only for themselves. They show no interest in obeying God or becoming more like Jesus. And as a result, they are very dangerous, in a very dangerous spiritual situation. There's a a website for an organization called harvest.org. It's a teaching arm of Harvest Bible Chapel, and it suggests the only real way for us as humans to know if someone has truly become a Christian is to observe that person's life on the outside. Since we cannot see the interior of the human heart as God does, we have to look for some result or indicator of their faith. But what does Scripture actually say about whether or not we can truly tell if someone really believes in God and in Christ. Well, Jesus, when he was preaching about the narrow way to God, he said these words in Matthew's gospel. He says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by the fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. James agrees with Jesus. James chapter 2, he says, But some will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless. So the overarching theme of all of this is pretty simple. Mere words are not sufficient enough to demonstrate true and earnest, heartfelt faith in God and in Christ Jesus. Uh, Instead, the proof of faith, the evidence of that which the writer of Hebrews calls unseen, it has to be something more than just mere words. Because man is prone to empty and worthless words. Our human mouths are so trapped by sin that we are often prone to lying. And so when someone says, I believe, we have two choices in those situations and how we will respond to that. We can either merely accept that our friend really truly is being faithful and does believe, or we can examine their lives to look for evidence that backs up this claim that they believe. But critics, critics of God's word are quick to point out that, well, who are you? In what place are you to examine someone else's life Have you first examined your own life and your own evidence of faith? They would argue that we would do better to examine our own lives first, looking for proof in our own lives, and they're not wrong. However true that criticism may be, it does not negate this simple truth. What we say that we believe must always be backed up by actions 
that prove what we say. This isn't only important in matters of faith, by the way. For example, if we say that we believe that everyone should have the same access to a quality education, no matter where that person lives, regardless of that person's wealth, then our actions had better back up that belief. Or if we say that we think or we believe that only one kind of car is worth driving. For example, if we say Cadillac is the only car worth driving, you shouldn't drive any other car other than a Cadillac, but we have two Fords parked in our garage. People are going to not believe us when we say that Cadillac is the only kind of car you should drive. Honest and earnest faith is best proven through action. We demonstrate that Jesus is more than simply talk for us when we live every moment of our lives for him. But when we live for anything, anything other than Jesus, when we live for ourselves, when we live for some other influential person or other kind of thing in our lives, yet we confess that Jesus is our all in all, then people start to wonder if we're not just a liar or a deceiver. The writer of Hebrews agrees with that. He says our faith must be active. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we cannot see. So, what does all of this evidence talk, this proof of our faith talk, have to do with Ruth? As we take up Another look at chapter one this morning. We find ourselves with an important question to answer. Did Ruth proclaim faith in God in verse 16? Let me remind you of verse 16 once more. It said, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And now here's probably the critical component. Your God will be my God. Even the greatest of skeptics cannot overlook the simple fact that Ruth proclaimed to Naomi, your God will be my God. To call for just a moment that Ruth is a Moabite, right? Her people worshipped pagan gods like Molech and Ashereth, Baal. Her people were a pagan people, so she would have grown up knowing the existence of Many different kinds of gods. But here in in, in an earnest and heartfelt desire to remain with Naomi, her mother-in-law, she cries out in acceptance of just one God. Ruth's God. Naomi's God. Yahweh God. Tony Evans, he says, in renouncing the idolatry of the Moabites and embracing Israel's God as her own, Ruth made a complete break with her past. A complete break with her past. A complete and total break with what she used to be. Ruth has no intention of returning home to Moab, probably ever. She has no need to return to her mother or her father. She has no interest in her people. She has no claim to her land. Ruth intends for Bethlehem to become home for her, for Israel to become her people, and in my most humble opinion, for Yahweh to be her God. She is not the old Ruth that she once was. Before she married into this family as a Moabite woman before she came to love this family. Ruth has been changed. Ruth is someone new. The evidence of this change is her willingness, her fervent desire to remain with Naomi and to call Bethlehem home and to worship Yahweh God. I don't see how we can read her words without being convinced that Ruth has been one For the Lord. She had been won for the Lord, by the way, by of all people, Elimelech and Naomi. 
who left Israel in their hour of need for greener pastures on the other side. What powerful proof, what better testimony could there ever be that God does indeed use perfectly imperfect people to move in the hearts of those who have not yet accepted him? There's one more powerful proof in Ruth's words when she says, your God will be my God. And it is this, conversion demands that we will never be the same again. Conversion demands that we will never be the same again. If you are willing to say, I have decided to follow Jesus, then you must also be willing to say, I have decided I will never be the old me again, ever. Conversion demands that we will never be the same again. Now, I want you to hear me closely. If you intend to say that you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you intend to confess Jesus Christ with your mouth and believe him in your heart, Romans 10, right? If you want the world to know that you have been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God, if you want people to actually believe that the old is gone and the new has come, then you cannot, you must not go on living as if Jesus never, ever came into your heart. Your actions before Jesus and your actions after Jesus have got to tell a different story. Conversion demands that we will never be the same old, sin-sick, death-bound man or woman of the earth that we once were. If Jesus hasn't made you new, then folks, you haven't fully trusted Jesus. It's just that simple. So, when we dig back into Ruth's story, she cried out. I can see her on her knees begging and pleading before Naomi and the God of all creation. And she says, don't urge me to go back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my God. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything other than death separates us. Did you see that up there? In just 66 words, Ruth have, has proven her conversion. Ruth has proven the change in her heart brought on by her meeting with the Yahweh God. And Ruth has proven that she is determined to remain with Naomi and also with God. So what does Ruth demonstrate for us in this determination? I'd like to take the rest of the time that I have left this morning to identify two proofs, two evidences of Ruth's determination that you and I would do so well to learn from, to seek to incorporate into our own faith journeys, our own new me walk. The first one is this. Trusting God can never be in part. Trusting God can never be in part. Following God is all or nothing. When I graduated high school and I went away to college for the first time, I had been accepted as a music major at Western Illinois University I was on a full-ride music scholarship. I had auditioned and been placed into four of Western's major vocal music ensembles. The University Choir, the Chamber Singers, the Jazz Choir, and the Magical Singers. I was well on my way to living my life's dream to be a vocal music teacher, to direct the great choirs of the world. The problem with this plan, though, was twofold. One... I wanted to teach vocal music, but I didn't want to play the piano. <laughs> I didn't want to learn the piano. I didn't want to practice the piano. The other problem was more personal, though. I wanted to be in college. I wanted to get my degree. I wanted to chase my dream, but I didn't want to be away from that one. 
And, and folks, it might not seem like a lot to you, but Macomb to Lena is a four-hour drive, and I didn't have a car. Here's the other thing, though, about being a vocal, vocal music teacher. It is absolutely an all-or-nothing choice. No school is going to hire a choral director who can't accompany their own choir, who can't run parts with the voices during rehearsal. Oh, and, and you know, there's another thing about being a music major, right, Jill? You don't date anyone except for the practice room, ever. What I wanted was an in-part opportunity to chase my dream. I wanted to select from the menu a la carte the parts of the journey that were interesting to me. And the rest, I just wanted to politely say, thanks, but no thanks. But it doesn't work that way. If you're going to be a music teacher, it is all or nothing. And so one month after starting my journey at Western, I chose nothing rather than all. I gave up and I went home. And yes, I know that the Lord was working at that moment. I know he had a different plan for me and for my life. I mean, who knew that that plan would mean that Jill and I would once again meet here in this place? We were there at the same time. We never really got to know each other. I can't imagine why. I was only there a month. You see, it's all or nothing. All or nothing. By the way, the Apostle Paul agrees with us on this all or nothing thing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, whether it is in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever it is you do, everything you do, whether words or deeds, do it for him. And he summarizes that in verse 23. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. As if you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that Ruth's determination proves her understanding that trusting God can never be something you do halfway. Trusting God can never be something that you do only when it is convenient for you. Uh, it is not something that should only be done in a moment of catastrophe or great need. Trusting God does not come with that prescription that says, Take as needed. Trusting God has to be every moment of every day. Otherwise, we are trusting in nothing at all. Ruth makes that abundantly clear to us. She leaves not one moment of her life out in her commitment to Naomi and God, did she? She said, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you stay, I'm going to stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. When was the last time you had that kind of conversation with God? When was the last time you said to God, where you go, I will go. Where you lead, I will go. I will follow you. you your people will be my people. You will be my God. When was the last time that you considered your all-in participation in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to go where God sends you? Are you willing to serve whom he serves? Are you willing to trust like Jesus trusted? Are you willing to trust God alone? Or maybe this one, are you willing to die as he died? Also that you might rise as he has risen. Pastor Tony Evans, remember what he said? He said, Ruth preferred widowhood and its challenges to abandoning Naomi and her God. And so in renouncing the idolatry of the Moabites, embracing Israel's God as her own, Ruth made a complete break with her past. Complete break with the past. All in, 100%. The second demonstration of Ruth's determination. Trusting God means being willing to go where he sends you 
Faithfully following God may require you to leave everything behind. There was a World War II veteran who was once recalling what it was like when his company boarded a naval carrier ship, set sail for the shores of Great Britain in 1945. The old man recalled that uh, his commanding officer advised each soldier to consider carefully what they might put into their shoulder bag. Because once they made sure, the journey was going to be long, arduous, and uncomfortable. He said to them, every item that you place in that shoulder pack must be considered carefully. Taking into account the item's weight, the longevity of that item, the actual necessity of that item. And so this old veteran remembered that the commander helped the men to decide what they should take with them by saying this. Take with you only what you believe is actually able to assist you in the moment of your mission. Everything else, leave behind. So that old veteran recalled, thinking to himself, is a straight razor going to be helpful in the moment of my mission? What about a shaving brush? Essential on the battlefield? And then he said, by the time we reached the shore and disembarked, the hull of the ship was littered with discarded items, things that were once thought to hold great importance and value, but in the hour of decision, in the hour of need, those things were left behind because they meant nothing. Here's the thing about trusting God. He expects us to trust him fully. And in trusting him fully, he also expects that where he sends us, we will go, gladly go. And that might mean that we have to leave something behind. Do you remember Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6? It said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways. Did you get that? In all of your ways, acknowledge him, submit to him. Then he will make your path straight. Not in just some of your ways, in all of your ways. Powerful words for us to live by, yet at the same time, these are distressing words. What if when I lean on God, that straight path that he sends me down calls me away from everything that I once loved? What then? When you pray for God's leading in your life, be sure to pray for God's leading with an open heart, friends, because... If you're going to ask him to lead you and guide you, then you had better be willing to go where he sends you. But do not overlook this caution. Because when you pray to the Lord for something, expect it to happen. So don't pray to him and ask him to show you the way if you're unwilling to actually go wherever it is he leads you. Sarah and I have some missionary friends in Panama. When they first felt the calling of the Lord to go and serve in the mission field, they strongly felt pulled to Eastern Europe. So they started to learn Russian. They thought it'd be helpful for them when they traveled to Eastern Europe and do ministry together for the Lord. But then they entered the process of committing their lives to missionary work. Both they and the mission agency prayed for God's leading asked where they might be called to serve, and it became abundantly clear that they were supposed to prepare themselves to serve in Panama, not Eastern Europe. The question before these two people was not, would they be willing to leave their families and go to Eastern Europe? It was, would they be willing to leave their families and go to Panama, to live on the border between Panama and Nicaragua, the most dangerous country in the world? When I left Western Illinois University and I returned home, I took classes for a semester at the local community college and then I had the opportunity to apply at Concordia University in River Forest, just a few miles east of here on North Avenue. The question that I faced when deciding whether to leave home once again, take the journey of a college education was this, am I really willing to leave behind everything that I had once lived for begin this new journey? Was I willing to leave home? Was I willing to leave the rural life for the city life? Was I willing to leave my hope of becoming a choral music teacher? Was I willing to leave Sarah behind again? 
Was I willing to leave it all behind just for the sake of following where the Lord seemed to be calling me? I stand here today in this pulpit as living proof that when you commit your way to the Lord and when necessary, you are willing to leave behind everything you once knew in order to follow the leading of the Lord, the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God never, ever leaves you stranded, ever. Never, ever. There have been terrible times along the way. There have been times of great poverty and despair in our lives. There are so many things that Sarah and I have simply had to overlook and go without in order to find ourselves in this place with you this morning. But one thing for us is perfectly clear. God has walked with us every step of the way. So when Ruth was on her knees begging Naomi, pleading with Naomi, please don't make me return home. Instead, I want to go with you, Naomi. I want to go to Bethlehem. She made this incredible decision to trust Naomi, to trust God, and to leave behind everything that she once knew. And what was her purpose? To serve Naomi and to serve God. Now I get it. Asking you if you would be willing to leave behind everything you know in order to faithfully follow God. For some of you this morning, it seems like a moot point. He might say, at my age, I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just calling a, you know, as I see it. (laughs) At my age. But what if he isn't asking you to physically leave behind everything? What if he isn't asking you to physically change your location, but he's rather asking you to change your spiritual address? What if he's asking you to leave behind not a place that you live, but rather the place that your heart has lived, the place that your heart has dwelled these many years? What if the big change that God is asking of you is not one, hey, would you move to Kokomo, Indiana? What if God is asking, will you allow me to move your heart? Are you willing to leave everything your heart has become accustomed to? The things that you so love in order that you might better know, love, and serve the one who so loves you. Are you willing You see, no one came out and asked Ruth if she was sure about her decision. But Naomi did say, listen to me, honey. If you do this, if you go to Bethlehem with me, if you live with me, if you remain as my daughter, you will be giving up everything you have ever known. And there is no guarantee that when we get to Bethlehem, there is any future for me, let alone for you. But Ruth didn't need to be asked if she was sure. Because her response to Naomi said everything that Naomi, and more importantly, God needed to hear. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Whom you love, I will love. You, God, will be my God. All in. Willing to give up everything ready to go where God was leading. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this powerful word this morning. Thank you for the reminder of Ruth's determination, her willingness to go so faithfully. Father, some might wonder if that means that Ruth went out without fear. We might wonder if that meant that Ruth never was Afraid that this wasn't going to work, that they were going to die, maybe? Certainly, she was afraid. But every time her fear rose up in her, I have to believe you met her with that same word that you have met your entire people with. Have no fear, little flock, for the Father in heaven loves you. So, Father, will you lead us to be willing to respond as Ruth did? 
Will you help our hearts to truly mean it when we say that where you go, we will go? Where you stay, you will stay? Will you help us to literally mean the words coming out of our mouth when we say that you, God, will be our God? Father, will you help us to be all in, not in part? Father, thank you for this incredible reminder of the importance of our prayers, that we mean what we say, and the condition of our hearts, that they are willing to follow up our, act, our words with actions. Father, thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing. We want to hear those voices out there as we sing about where we're going to follow God. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. and sisters, you just sang it. So the question is, did you mean it? Is it true? Where the Lord sends you, will you go? Will you follow him? Probably the most important question is, do you mean it when you say he is your God? Let your lives, not just today, not just this week, but forever, be the evidence 
that your hope is God and God alone. Go then with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of his Holy Spirit to be with you this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above me, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you next week or later this afternoon.